part three section twenty six of the maine woods by henry david thoreau this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three the allegash and east branch section twenty six tuesday july twenty eighth when we awoke we found a heavy dew on our blankets i lay awake very early and listened to the clear shrill ah ti 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 of the white-throated sparrow repeated at short intervals without the least variation for half an hour as if it could not enough express its happiness whether my companions heard it or not i know not but it was a kind of matins to me and the event of that forenoon it was a pleasant sunrise and we had a view of the mountains in the southeast Katahdin appeared about southeast by south a double-topped mountain about southeast by east and another portion of the same east southeast the last the indian called nurlumkitchtikuk and said that it was at the head of the east branch and we should pass near it on our return that way we did some more washing in the lake this morning and with our clothes hung about on the dead trees and rocks the shore looked like washing day at home the indian taking the hint borrowed the soap and walking into the lake washed his only cotton shirt on his person then put on his pants and let it dry on him i observed that he wore a cotton shirt originally white a greenish flannel one over it but no waistcoat flannel drawers and strong linen or duck pants which also had been white blue woolen stockings cowhide boots and a kosuth hat he carried no change of clothing but putting on a stout thick jacket which he laid aside in the canoe and seizing a full-sized axe his gun and ammunition and a blanket which would do for a sail or knapsack if wanted and strapping on his belt which contained a large sheath knife he walked off at once ready to be gone all summer this looked very independent a few simple and effective tools and no india rubber clothing he was always the first ready to start in the morning and if it had not held some of our property would not have been obliged to roll up his blanket instead of carrying a large bundle of his own extra clothing etc he brought back the great coats of moose tied up in his blanket i found that his outfit was the result of a long experience and in the main hardly to be improved on unless by washing and an extra shirt wanting a button here he walked off to a place where some indians had recently encamped and searched for one but i believe in vain having softened our stiffened boots and shoes with the pork fat the usual disposition of what was left at breakfast we crossed the lake early steering in a diagonal direction northeasterly about four miles to the outlet which was not to be discovered till we were close to it the indian name apmujinegamuk means lake that is crossed because the usual course lies across and not through it this is the largest of the allegash lakes and was the first st john water that we floated on it is shaped in the main like chesuncook there are no mountains or high hills very near it at bangor we had been told of a township many miles farther northwest it was indicated to us as containing the highest land thereabouts where by climbing a particular tree in the forest we could get a general idea of the country i have no doubt that the last was good advice but we did not go there we did not intend to go far down the allegash but merely to get a view of the great lakes which are its source and then return this way to the east branch of the penobscot the water now by good rights flowed northward if it could be said to flow at all after reaching the middle of the lake we found the waves as usual pretty high and the indian warned my companion who was nodding that he must not allow himself to fall asleep in the canoe lest he should upset us adding that when indians want to sleep in a canoe they lie down straight on the bottom but in this crowded one that was impossible however he said that he would nudge him if he saw him nodding a belt of dead trees stood all around the lake some far out in the water with others prostrate behind them and they made the shore for the most part almost inaccessible this is the effect of the dam at the outlet thus the natural sandy or rocky shore with its green fringe was concealed and destroyed we coasted westward along the north side 
searching for the outlet about one quarter of a mile distant from this savage-looking shore on which the waves were breaking violently knowing that it might easily be concealed amid this rubbish or by the overlapping of the shore it is remarkable how little these important gates to a lake are blazoned there is no triumphal arch over the modest inlet or outlet but at some undistinguished point it trickles in or out through the uninterrupted forest almost as through a sponge we reached the outlet in about an hour and carried over the dam there which is quite a solid structure and about one quarter of a mile farther there was a second dam the reader will perceive that the result of this particular damming about chamberlain lake is that the headwaters of the st john are made to flow by bangor they have thus dammed all the larger lakes raising their broad surfaces many feet moosehead for instance some forty miles long with its steamer on it thus turning the forces of nature against herself that they might float their spoils out of the country they rapidly run out of these immense forests all the finer and more accessible pine timber and then leave the bears to watch the decaying dams not clearing nor cultivating the land nor making roads nor building houses but leaving it a wilderness as they found it in many parts only these dams remain like deserted beaver dams think how much land they have flowed without asking nature's leave when the state wishes to endow an academy or university it grants it a tract of forest land one saw represents an academy a gang a university the wilderness experiences a sudden rise of all her streams and lakes she feels ten thousand vermin gnawing at the base of her noblest trees many combining drag them off jarring over the roots of the survivors and tumble them into the nearest stream till the fairest having fallen they scamper off to ransack some new wilderness and all is still again it is as when a migrating army of mice girdles a forest of pines the chopper fells trees from the same motive that the mouse gnaws them to get his living you tell me that he has a more interesting family than the mouse that is as it happens he speaks of a berth of timber a good place for him to get into just as a worm might when the chopper would praise a pine he will commonly tell you that the one he cut was so big that a yoke of oxen stood on its stump as if that were what the pine had grown for to become the footstool of oxen in my mind's eye i can see these unwieldy tame deer with a yoke binding them together and brazen-tipped horns betraying their servitude taking their stand on the stump of each giant pine in succession throughout this whole forest and chewing their cud there until it is nothing but an ox pasture and run out at that as if it were good for the oxen and some terebinthine or other medicinal quality ascended into their nostrils or is their elevated position intended merely as a symbol of the fact that the pastoral comes next in order to the sylvan or hunter life the character of the logger's admiration is betrayed by his very mode of expressing it if he told all that was in his mind he would say it was so big that i cut it down and then a yoke of oxen could stand on its stump he admires the log the carcass or corpse more than the tree why my dear sir the tree might have stood on its own stump and a great deal more comfortably and firmly than a yoke of oxen can if you had not cut it down what right have you to celebrate the virtues of the man you murdered the anglo-american can indeed cut down and grub up all this waving forest and make a stump speech and vote for buchanan on its ruins but he cannot converse with the spirit of the tree he fells he cannot read the poetry and mythology which retire as he advances he ignorantly erases mythological tablets in order to print his handbills and town meeting warrants on them before he has learned his a b c in the beautiful but mystic lore of the wilderness which spencer and dante had just begun to read he cuts it down coins a pine tree shilling as if to signify the pine's value to him puts up a d strict schoolhouse and introduces webster's spelling book below the last dam the river being swift and shallow though broad enough we too walked about half a mile to lighten the canoe i made it a rule to carry my knapsack when i walked and also to keep it tied to a crossbar when in the canoe that it might be found with the canoe if we should upset 
i heard the dog day locust here and afterward on the carries a sound which i had associated only with more open if not settled countries the area for locusts must be small in the main woods we were now fairly on the allegash river which name our indian said meant hemlock bark these waters flow northward about one hundred miles at first very feebly then southeasterly two hundred and fifty more to the bay of fundy after perhaps two miles of river we entered heron lake called on the map pangoquahem scaring up forty or fifty young shakorways sheldrakes at the entrance which ran over the water with great rapidity as usual in a long line this was the fourth great lake lying northwest and southeast like chesuncook and most of the long lakes in that neighborhood and judging from the map it is about ten miles long we had entered it on the southwest side and saw a dark mountain northeast over the lake not very far off nor high which the indian said was called peaked mountain and used by explorers to look for timber from there was also some other high land more easterly the shores were in the same ragged and unsightly condition encumbered with dead timber both fallen and standing as in the last lake owing to the dam on the allegash below some low points or islands were almost drowned i saw something white a mile off on the water which turned out to be a great gull on a rock in the middle which the indian would have been glad to kill and eat but it flew away long before we were near and also a flock of summer ducks that were about the rock with it i asking him about herons since this was heron lake he said that he found the blue heron's nest in the hardwood trees i thought that i saw a light-colored object move along the opposite or northern shore four or five miles distant he did not know what it could be unless it were a moose though he had never seen a white one but he said that he could distinguish a moose anywhere on shore clear across the lake rounding a point we stood across a bay for a mile and a half or two miles toward a large island three or four miles down the lake we met with ephemerae shadfly midway about a mile from the shore and they evidently fly over the whole lake on moosehead i had seen a large devil's needle half a mile from the shore coming from the middle of the lake where it was three or four miles wide at least it had probably crossed but at last of course you come to lakes so large that an insect cannot fly across them and this perhaps will serve to distinguish a large lake from a small one we landed on the southeast side of the island which was rather elevated and densely wooded with a rocky shore in season for an early dinner somebody had camped there not long before and left the frame on which they stretched a moose hide which our indian criticized severely thinking it showed but little woodcraft here were plenty of the shells of crayfish or freshwater lobsters which had been washed ashore such as have given a name to some ponds and streams they are commonly four or five inches long the indian proceeded at once to cut a canoe birch slanted it up against another tree on the shore tying it with a withe and lay down to sleep in its shade when we were on the caucomgomoc he recommended to us a new way home the very one which we had first thought of by the st john he even said that it was easier and would take but little more time than the other by the east branch of the penobscot though very much farther round and taking the map he showed where we should be each night for he was familiar with the route according to his calculation we should reach the french settlements the next night after this by keeping northward down the allegash and when we got into the main st john the banks would be more or less settled all the way as if that were a recommendation there would be but one or two falls with short carrying places and we should go down the stream very fast even a hundred miles a day if the wind allowed and he indicated where we should carry over into eel river to save a bend below woodstock in new brunswick and so into the Scudic lake and thence to the matawamkeg it would be about three hundred and sixty miles to bangor this way though only about one hundred and sixty by the other but in the former case we should explore the st john from its source through two-thirds of its course as well as the Scudic lake in matawamkeg and we were again tempted to go that way i feared however that the banks of the st john were too much settled 
when i asked him which course would take us through the wildest country he said the route by the east branch partly from this consideration as also from its shortness we resolved to adhere to the latter route and perhaps ascend katahdin on the way we made this island the limit of our excursion in this direction we had now seen the largest of the allegash lakes the next dam was about fifteen miles farther north down the allegash and it was dead water so far we had been told in bangor of a man who lived alone a sort of hermit at this dam to take care of it who spent his time tossing a bullet from one hand to the other for want of employment as if we might want to call on him this sort of tit-for-tat intercourse between his two hands bandying to and fro a leaden subject seems to have been his symbol for society this island according to the map was about a hundred and ten miles in a straight line north-northwest from bangor and about ninety-nine miles east-southeast from quebec there was another island visible toward the north end of the lake with an elevated clearing on it but we learned afterward that it was not inhabited had only been used as a pasture for cattle which summered in these woods though our informant said that there was a hut on the mainland near the outlet of the lake this unnaturally smooth-shaven squarish spot in the midst of the otherwise uninterrupted forest only reminded us how uninhabited the country was you would sooner expect to meet with a bear than an ox in such a clearing at any rate it must have been a surprise to the bears when they came across it such seen far or near you know at once to be man's work for nature never does it in order to let in the light to the earth as on a lake he clears off the forest on the hillsides and plains and sprinkles fine grass seed like an enchanter and so carpets the earth with a firm sward end of part three section twenty six recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three section twenty seven of the maine woods by henry david thoreau this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three the allegash and east branch section twenty seven polis had evidently more curiosity respecting the few settlers in those woods than we if nothing was said he took it for granted that we wanted to go straight to the next log hut having observed that we came by the log huts at chesuncook and the blind canadians at the mud pond carry without stopping to communicate with the inhabitants he took occasion now to suggest that the usual way was when you came near a house to go to it and tell the inhabitants what you had seen or heard and then they tell you what they had seen but we laughed and said that we had had enough of houses for the present and had come here partly to avoid them in the meanwhile the wind increasing blew down the indian's birch and created such a sea that we found ourselves prisoners on the island the nearest shore which was the western being perhaps a mile distant and we took the canoe out to prevent its drifting away we did not know but we should be compelled to spend the rest of the day and the night there at any rate the indian went to sleep again in the shade of his birch my companion busied himself drying his plants and i rambled along the shore westward which was quite stony and obstructed with fallen bleached or drifted trees for four or five rods in width i found growing on this broad rocky and gravelly shore the salix rostrata discolor and lucida ranunculus recurvatus potentilla norvegica scutellaria lateriflora eupatorium purpureum aster tradescani mentha canadensis epilobium angustifolium abundant lycopus sinuatus solidago lanceolata spirea salicifolia antenaria margaritica prunella rumex acetosella raspberries wool-grass onoclea etc the nearest trees were betula papyracea and excelsa and populus temuloides i give these names because it was my farthest northern point our indian said that he was a doctor and could tell me some medicinal use 
for every plant I could show him. I immediately tried him. He said that the inner bark of the aspen, populus tremuloides, was good for sore eyes, and so with various other plants, proving himself as good as his word. According to his account, he had acquired such knowledge in his youth from a wise old Indian with whom he associated, and he lamented that the present generation of Indians had lost a great deal. He said that the caribou was a very great runner, that there was none about this lake now, though there used to be many, and pointing to the belt of dead trees caused by the dams, he added, no like em stump, when he sees that, he's scared. Pointing southeasterly over the lake and distant forest, he observed, me go old town in three days. I asked how he would get over the swamps and fallen trees. Oh, said he, in winter all covered, go anywhere on snowshoes right across lakes. When I asked how he went, he said, first I go Katahdin, west side, then I go Millinocket, then Pamadumcook, then Nicketow, then Lincoln, then Old Town, or else he went a shorter way by the Piscataquis. What a wilderness walk for a man to take alone. None of your half-mile swamps, none of your mile-wide woods merely, as on the skirts of our towns, without hotels, only a dark mountain or a lake for guide-board and station, over ground much of it impassable in summer. It reminded me of Prometheus Bound, here was travelling of the old heroic kind over the unaltered face of nature from the allegash or hemlock river and pangoquahem lake across great apmugenicamook and leaving the nurlum's keechticook mountain on his left he takes his way under the bare haunted slopes of suniunk and katahdin mountains to pamadumcook and millinocket's inland seas where often gulls eggs may increase his store and so on to the forks of the Nikitau, Nia Soseb, we alone Joseph, seeing what our folks see, ever pushing the boughs of the fir and spruce aside with his load of firs, contending day and night, night and day, with the shaggy demon vegetation, travelling through the mossy graveyard of trees. Or he could go by that rough tooth of the sea, Kineo, great source of arrows and of spears to the ancients, when weapons of stone were used seeing and hearing moose caribou bears porcupines lynxes wolves and panthers places where he might live and die and never hear of the united states which makes such a noise in the world never hear of america so called from the name of a european gentleman there is a lumberer's road called the eagle lake road from the saboyas to the east side of this lake it may seem strange that any road through such a wilderness should be passable even in winter when the snow is three or four feet deep but at that season wherever lumbering operations are actively carried on teams are continually passing on the single track and it becomes as smooth almost as a railway i am told that in the aroostook country the sleds are required by law to be of one width four feet and sleighs must be altered to fit the track so that one runner may go in one rut and the other follow the horse yet it is very bad turning out we had for some time seen a thunder shower coming up from the west over the woods of the island and heard the muttering of the thunder though we were in doubt whether it would reach us but now the darkness rapidly increasing and a fresh breeze rustling the forest we hastily put up the plants which we had been drying and with one consent made a rush for the tent material and set about pitching it a place was selected and stakes and pins cut in the shortest possible time and we were pinning it down lest it should be blown away when the storm suddenly burst over us as we lay huddled together under the tent which leaped considerably about the sides with our baggage at our feet we listened to some of the grandest thunder which i ever heard rapid peals round and plump bang 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 in succession like artillery from some fortress in the sky and the lightning was proportionally brilliant the indian said it must be good powder all for the benefit of the moose and us echoing far over the concealed lakes i thought it must be a place which the thunder loved where the lightning practised to keep its hand in and it would do no harm to shatter a few pines what had become of the ephemerae and devil's needles then 
were they prudent enough to seek harbor before the storm perhaps their motions might guide the voyageur looking out i perceived that the violent shower falling on the lake had almost instantaneously flattened the waves the commander of that fortress had smoothed it for us so and it clearing off we resolved to start immediately before the wind raised them again going outside i said that i saw clouds still in the southwest and heard thunder there the indian asked if the thunder went lound round saying that if it did we should have more rain i thought that it did we embarked nevertheless and pulled rapidly back toward the dams the white-throated sparrows on the shore were about singing ah ti 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 or else ah ti 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 at the outlet of chamberlain lake we were overtaken by another gusty rainstorm which compelled us to take shelter the indian under his canoe on the bank and we ran under the edge of the dam however we were more scared than wet from my covert i could see the indian peeping out from beneath his canoe to see what had become of the rain when we had taken our respective places thus once or twice the rain not coming down in earnest we commenced rambling about the neighborhood for the wind had by this time raised such waves on the lake that we could not stir and we feared that we should be obliged to camp there we got an early supper on the dam and tried for fish there while waiting for the tumult to subside the fishes were not only few but small and worthless and the indian declared that there were no good fishes in the st john's waters that we must wait till we got to the penobscot waters at length just before sunset we set out again it was a wild evening when we coasted up the north side of this apmugenegamook lake one thunderstorm was just over and the waves which it had raised still running with violence and another storm was now seen coming up in the southwest far over the lake but it might be worse in the morning and we wished to get as far as possible on our way up the lake while we might it blowed hard against the northern shore about an eighth of a mile distant on our left and there was just as much sea as our shallow canoe would bear without our taking unusual care that which we kept off and toward which the waves were driving was as dreary and harbourless a shore as you can conceive for half a dozen rods in width it was a perfect maze of submerged trees all dead and bare and bleaching some standing half their original height others prostrate and criss-across above or beneath the surface and mingled with them were loose trees and limbs and stumps beating about imagine the wharves of the largest city in the world decayed and the earth and planking washed away leaving the spiles standing in loose order but often of twice the ordinary height and mingled with and beating against them the wreck of ten thousand navies all their spars and timbers while there rises from the water's edge the densest and grimmest wilderness ready to supply more material when the former fails and you may get a faint idea of that coast we could not have landed if we would without the gravest danger of being swamped so blow as it might we must depend on coasting by it it was twilight too and that stormy cloud was advancing rapidly in our rear it was a pleasant excitement yet we were glad to reach at length in the dusk the cleared shore of the chamberlain farm we landed on a low and thinly wooded point there and while my companions were pitching the tent i ran up to the house to get some sugar our six pounds being gone it was no wonder they were for polis had a sweet tooth he would first fill his dipper nearly a third full of sugar and then add the coffee to it here was a clearing extending back from the lake to a hilltop with some dark-coloured log buildings and a storehouse in it and half a dozen men standing in front of the principal hut greedy for news among them was the man who tended the dam on the allegash and tossed the bullet he having charge of the dams and learning that we were going to webster stream the next day told me that some of their men who were haying at telos lake had shut the dam at the canal there in order to catch trout and if we wanted more water to take us through the canal we might raise the gate for he would like to have it raised the chamberlain farm is no doubt a cheerful opening in the woods 
but such was the lateness of the hour that it has left but a dusky impression on my mind as i have said the influx of light merely is civilizing yet i fancied that they walked about on sundays in their clearings somewhat as in a prison yard they were unwilling to spare more than four pounds of brown sugar unlocking the storehouse to get it since they only kept a little for such cases as this and they charged twenty cents a pound for it which certainly it was worth to get it up there when i returned to the shore it was quite dark but we had a rousing fire to warm and dry us by and a snug apartment behind it the indian went up to the house to inquire after a brother who had been absent hunting a year or two and while another shower was beginning i groped about cutting spruce and arborvitae twigs for a bed i preferred the arborvitae on account of its fragrance and spread it particularly thick about the shoulders it is remarkable with what pure satisfaction the traveller in these woods will reach his camping-ground on the eve of a tempestuous night like this as if he had got to his inn and rolling himself in his blanket stretch himself on his six feet by two bed of dripping fir twigs with a thin sheet of cotton for roof snug as a meadow mouse in its nest invariably our best nights were those when it rained for then we were not troubled with mosquitoes you soon come to disregard rain on such excursions at least in the summer it is so easy to dry yourself supposing a dry change of clothing is not to be had you can much sooner dry you by such a fire as you can make in the woods than in anybody's kitchen the fireplace is so much larger and wood so much more abundant a shed-shaped tent will catch and reflect the heat like a yankee baker and you may be drying while you are sleeping some who have leaky roofs in the towns may have been kept awake but we were soon lulled asleep by a steady soaking rain which lasted all night to-night the rain not coming at once with violence the twigs were soon dried by the reflective heat wednesday july twenty ninth when we awoke it had done raining though it was still cloudy the fire was put out and the indian's boots which stood under the eaves of the tent were half full of water he was much more improvident in such respects than either of us and he had to thank us for keeping his powder dry we decided to cross the lake at once before breakfast or while we could and before starting i took the bearing of the shore which we wished to strike south-south-east about three miles distant lest a sudden misty rain should conceal it when we were midway though the bay in which we were was perfectly quiet and smooth we found the lake already wide awake outside but not dangerously or unpleasantly so nevertheless when you get out on one of those lakes in a canoe like this you do not forget that you are completely at the mercy of the wind and a fickle power it is the playful waves may at any time become too rude for you in their sport and play right on over you we saw a few shikorways and a fish-hawk thus early and after much steady paddling and dancing over the dark waves of atmujenegamook we found ourselves in the neighbourhood of the southern land heard the waves breaking on it and turned our thoughts wholly to that side after coasting eastward along this shore a mile or two we breakfasted on a rocky point the first convenient place that offered it was well enough that we crossed thus early for the waves now ran quite high and we should have been obliged to go round somewhat but beyond this point we had comparatively smooth water you can commonly go along one side or the other of a lake when you cannot cross it the indian was looking at the hard wood ridges from time to time and said that he would like to buy a few hundred acres somewhere about this lake asking our advice it was to buy as near the crossing place as possible my companion and i having a minute's discussion on some point of ancient history were amused by the attitude which the indian who could not tell what we were talking about assumed he constituted himself umpire and judging by our air and gesture he very seriously remarked from time to time you beat or he beat end of section twenty seven recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three section twenty eight of the maine woods by henry david thoreau 
this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three the allagash and east branch section twenty eight leaving a spacious bay a northeasterly prolongation of chamberlain lake on our left we entered through a short strait into a small lake a couple of miles over called on the map telesinus but the indian had no distinct name for it and thence into telos lake which he called petewigamgamok or burnt ground lake this curved round toward the northeast and may have been three or four miles long as we paddled he had not been here since eighteen twenty five he did not know what telos meant thought it was not indian he used the word spokelogan for an inlet in the shore which led nowhere and when i asked its meaning said that there was no indian in him there was a clearing with a house and barn on the southwest shore temporarily occupied by some men who were getting the hay as we had been told also a clearing for a pasture on a hill on the west side of the lake we landed on a rocky point on the northeast side to look at some red pines pinus resinosa the first we had noticed and get some cones for our few which grow in concord do not bear any the outlet from the lake into the east branch of the penobscot is an artificial one and it was not very apparent where it was exactly but the lake ran curving far up northeasterly into two narrow valleys or ravines as if it had for a long time been groping its way toward the penobscot waters or remembered when it anciently flowed there by observing where the horizon was lowest and following the longest of these we at length reached the dam having come about a dozen miles from the last camp somebody had left a line set for trout and the jackknife with which the bait had been cut on the dam beside it an evidence that man was near and on a deserted log close by a loaf of bread baked in a yankee baker these proved the property of a solitary hunter whom we soon met and canoe and gun and traps were not far off he told us that it was twenty miles farther on our route to the foot of grand lake where you could catch as many trout as you wanted and that the first house below the foot of the lake on the east branch was hunt's about forty-five miles farther though there was one about a mile and a half up trout stream some fifteen miles ahead but it was rather a blind route to it it turned out that though the stream was in our favour we did not reach the next house till the morning of the third day after this the nearest permanently inhabited house behind us was now a dozen miles distant so that the interval between the two nearest houses on our route was about sixty miles this hunter who was a quite small sunburnt man having already carried his canoe over and baked his loaf had nothing so interesting and pressing to do as to observe our transit he had been out a month or more alone how much more wild and adventurous his life than that of the hunter in concord woods who gets back to his house in the mill dam every night yet they in the towns who have wild oats to sow commonly sow them on cultivated and comparatively exhausted ground and as for the rowdy world in the large cities so little enterprise has it that it never adventures in this direction but like vermin clubs together in alleys and drinking saloons its highest accomplishment perchance to run beside a fire engine and throw brickbats but the former is comparatively an independent and successful man getting his living in a way that he likes without disturbing his human neighbours how much more respectable also is the life of the solitary pioneer or settler in these or any woods having real difficulties not of his own creation drawing his subsistence directly from nature than that of the helpless multitudes in the towns who depend on gratifying the extremely artificial wants of society and are thrown out of employment by hard times here for the first time we found the raspberries really plenty that is on passing the height of land between the allagash and the east branch of the penobscot the same was true of the blueberries telos lake the head of the st john on this side and webster pond the head of the east branch of the penobscot are only about a mile apart and they are connected by a ravine in which but little digging was required 
to make the water of the former which is the highest flow into the latter this canal which is something less than a mile long and about four rods wide was made a few years before my first visit to maine since then the lumber of the upper allegash and its lakes has been run down the penobscot that is up the allegash which here consists principally of a chain of large and stagnant lakes whose thoroughfares or river links have been made nearly equally stagnant by damming and then down the penobscot the rush of the water has produced such changes in the canal that it has now the appearance of a very rapid mountain stream flowing through a ravine and you would not suspect that any digging had been required to persuade the waters of the st john to flow into the penobscot here it was so winding that one could see but little way down it is stated by springer in his forest life that the cause of this canal being dug was this according to the treaty of eighteen forty two with great britain it was agreed that all the timber run down the st john which rises in maine when within the province of new brunswick shall be dealt with as if it were the produce of the said province which was thought by our side to mean that it should be free from taxation immediately the province wishing to get something out of the yankees levied a duty on all the timber that passed down the st john but to satisfy its own subjects made a corresponding discount on the stumpage charged those hauling timber from the crown lands the result was that the yankees made the st john run the other way or down the penobscot so that the province lost both its duty and its water while the yankees being greatly enriched had reason to thank it for the suggestion it is wonderful how well watered this country is as you paddle across a lake bays will be pointed out to you by following up which and perhaps the tributary stream which empties in you may after a short portage or possibly at some seasons none at all get into another river which empties far away from the one you were on generally you may go in any direction in a canoe by making frequent but not very long portages you are only realizing once more what all nature distinctly remembers here for no doubt the waters flowed thus in a former geological period and instead of being a lake country it was an archipelago it seems as if the more youthful and impressible streams can hardly resist the numerous invitations and temptations to leave their native beds and run down their neighbors channels your carries are often over half submerged ground on the dry channels of a former period in carrying from one river to another i did not go over such high and rocky ground as in going about the falls of the same river for in the former case i was once lost in a swamp as i have related and again found an artificial canal which appeared to be natural i remember once dreaming of pushing a canoe up the rivers of maine and that when i had got so high that the channels were dry i kept on through the ravines and gorges nearly as well as before by pushing a little harder and now it seemed to me that my dream was partially realized wherever there is a channel for water there is a road for the canoe the pilot of the steamer which ran from old town up the penobscot in eighteen fifty four told me that she drew only fourteen inches and would run easily in two feet of water though they did not like to it is said that some western steamers can run on a heavy dew whence we can imagine what a canoe may do montresor who was sent from quebec by the english about seventeen sixty to explore the route to the kennebec over which arnold afterward passed supplied the penobscot near its source with water by opening the beaver dams and he says this is often done he afterward states that the governor of canada had forbidden to molest the beaver about the outlet of the kennebec from moosehead lake on account of the service which their dams did by raising the water for navigation this canal so called was a considerable and extremely rapid and rocky river the indian decided that there was water enough in it without raising the dam which would only make it more violent and that he would run down it alone while we carried the greater part of the baggage our provision being about half consumed there was the less left in the canoe we had thrown away the pork keg and wrapped its contents in birch bark which is the unequalled wrapping paper of the woods following a moist trail through the forest 
we reached the head of webster pond about the same time with the indian notwithstanding the velocity with which he moved our route being the most direct the indian name of webster stream of which this pond is the source is according to him madunkchunk that is height of land and of the pond madunkchunk gamook or height of land pond the latter was two or three miles long we passed near a pine on its shore which had been splintered by lightning perhaps the day before this was the first proper east branch penobscot water that we came to at the outlet of webster lake was another dam at which we stopped and picked raspberries while the indian went down the stream a half mile through the forest to see what he had got to contend with there was a deserted log camp here apparently used the previous winter with its hovel or barn for cattle in the hut was a large fir twig bed raised two feet from the floor occupying a large part of the single apartment a long narrow table against the wall with a stout log bench before it and above the table a small window the only one there was which admitted a feeble light it was a simple and strong fort erected against the cold and suggested what valiant trencher work had been done there i discovered one or two curious wooden traps which had not been used for a long time in the woods near by the principal part consisted of a long and slender pole we got our dinner on the shore on the upper side of the dam as we were sitting by our fire concealed by the earth bank of the dam a long line of shelldrake half grown came waddling over it from the water below passing within about a rod of us so that we could almost have caught them in our hands they were very abundant on all the streams and lakes which we visited and every two or three hours they would rush away in a long string over the water before us twenty to fifty of them at once rarely ever flying but running with great rapidity up or down the stream even in the midst of the most violent rapids and apparently as fast up as down or else crossing diagonally the old as it appeared behind and driving them and flying to the front from time to time as if to direct them we also saw many small black dippers which behaved in a similar manner and once or twice a few black ducks an indian at old town had told us that we should be obliged to carry ten miles between telos lake on the st john and second lake on the east branch of the penobscot but the lumberers whom we met assured us that there would not be more than a mile of carry it turned out that the indian who had lately been over this route was nearest right as far as we were concerned however if one of us could have assisted the indian in managing the canoe in the rapids we might have run the greater part of the way but as he was alone in the management of the canoe in such places we were obliged to walk the greater part i did not feel quite ready to try such an experiment on webster stream which has so bad a reputation according to my observation a bateau properly manned shoots rapids as a matter of course which a single indian with a canoe carries round my companion and i carried a good part of the baggage on our shoulders while the indian took that which would be least injured by wet in the canoe we did not know when we should see him again for he had not been this way since the canal was cut nor for more than thirty years he agreed to stop when he got to smooth water come up and find our path if he could and halloo for us and after waiting a reasonable time go on and try again and we were to look out in like manner for him he commenced by running through the sluice way and over the dam as usual standing up in his tossing canoe and was soon out of sight behind a point in a wild gorge this webster stream is well known to lumbermen as a difficult one it is exceedingly rapid and rocky and also shallow and can hardly be considered navigable unless that may mean that what is launched in it is sure to be carried swiftly down it though it may be dashed to pieces by the way it is somewhat like navigating a thunder spout with commonly an irresistible force urging you on you have got to choose your own course each moment between the rocks and shallows and to get into it moving forward always with the utmost possible moderation and often holding on if you can that you may inspect the rapids before you by the indian's direction we took an old path on the south side which appeared to keep down the stream though at a considerable distance from it cutting off bends perhaps to second lake 
having first taken the course from the map with a compass which was northeasterly for safety it was a wild wood path with a few tracks of oxen which had been driven over it probably to some old camp clearing for pasturage mingled with the tracks of moose which had lately used it we kept on steadily for about an hour without putting down our packs occasionally winding around or climbing over a fallen tree for the most part far out of sight and hearing of the river till after walking about three miles we were glad to find that the path came to the river again at an old campground where there was a small opening in the forest at which we paused swiftly as the shallow and rocky river ran here a continuous rapid with dancing waves i saw as i sat on the shore a long string of sheldrakes which something scared run up the opposite side of the stream by me with the same ease that they commonly did down it just touching the surface of the waves and getting an impulse from them as they flowed from under them but they soon came back driven by the indian who had fallen a little behind us on account of the windings he shot round a point just above and came to land by us with considerable water in his canoe he had found it as he said very strong water and had been obliged to land once before to empty out what he had taken in he complained that it strained him to paddle so hard in order to keep his canoe straight in its course having no one in the bows to aid him and shallow as it was said that it would be no joke to upset there for the force of the water was such that he had as lief i would strike him over the head with a paddle as have that water strike him seeing him come out of that gap was as if you should pour water down an inclined and zigzag trough then drop a nutshell into it and taking a short cut to the bottom get there in time to see it come out notwithstanding the rush and tumult right side up and only partly full of water after a moment's breathing space while i held his canoe he was soon out of sight again around another bend and we shouldering our packs resumed our course End of part three, section twenty eight, recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, section twenty nine of the Maine Woods by Henry David Thoreau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, the Allegash and East Branch, section twenty nine we did not at once fall into our path again but made our way with difficulty along the edge of the river till at length striking inland through the forest we recovered it before going a mile we heard the indian calling to us he had come up through the woods and along the path to find us having reached sufficiently smooth water to warrant his taking us in the shore was about one-fourth of a mile distant through a dense dark forest and as he led us back to it winding rapidly about to the right and left i had the curiosity to look down carefully and found that he was following his steps backward i could only occasionally perceive his trail in the moss and yet he did not appear to look down nor hesitate an instant but led us out exactly to his canoe this surprised me for without a compass or the sight or noise of the river to guide us we could not have kept our course many minutes and could have retraced our steps but a short distance with a great deal of pains and very slowly using a laborious circumspection but it was evident that he could go back through the forest wherever he had been during the day after this rough walking in the dark woods it was an agreeable change to glide down the rapid river in the canoe once more this river which was about the size of our assabet in concord though still very swift was almost perfectly smooth here and showed a very visible declivity a regularly inclined plane for several miles like a mirror set a little aslant on which we coasted down this very obvious regular descent particularly plain when i regarded the water line against the shores made a singular impression on me which the swiftness of our motion probably enhanced so that we seemed to be gliding down a much steeper declivity than we were and that we could not save ourselves from rapids and falls if we should suddenly come to them my companion did not perceive this slope but i have a surveyor's eyes and i satisfied myself that it was no ocular illusion 
you could tell at a glance on approaching such a river which way the water flowed though you might perceive no motion i observed the angle at which a level line would strike the surface and calculated the amount of fall in a rod which did not need to be remarkably great to produce this effect it was very exhilarating and the perfection of travelling quite unlike floating on our dead conquered river the coasting down this inclined mirror which was now and then gently winding down a mountain indeed between two evergreen forests edged with lofty dead white pines sometimes slanted halfway over the stream and destined soon to bridge it i saw some monsters there nearly destitute of branches and scarcely diminishing in diameter for eighty or ninety feet as we thus swept along our indian repeated in a deliberate and drawling tone the words daniel webster great lawyer apparently reminded of him by the name of the stream and he described his calling on him once in boston at what he supposed was his boarding-house he had no business with him but merely went to pay his respects as we should say in answer to our questions he described his person well enough it was on the day after webster delivered his bunker hill oration which i believe polis heard the first time he called he waited till he was tired without seeing him and then went away the next time he saw him go by the door of the room in which he was waiting several times in his shirt-sleeves without noticing him he thought that if he had come to see indians they would not have treated him so at length after very long delay he came in walked toward him and asked in a loud voice gruffly what do you want and he thinking at first by the motion of his hand that he was going to strike him said to himself you'd better take care if you try that i shall know what to do he did not like him and declared that all he said was not worth talk about a musquash we suggested that probably mr webster was very busy and had a great many visitors just then coming to falls and rapids our easy progress was suddenly terminated the indian went along shore to inspect the water while we climbed over the rocks picking berries the peculiar growth of blueberries on the tops of large rocks here made the impression of high land and indeed this was the height of land stream when the indian came back he remarked you got to walk ver strong water so taking out his canoe he launched it again below the falls and was soon out of sight at such times he would step into the canoe take up his paddle and with an air of mystery start off looking far down stream and keeping his own counsel as if absorbing all the intelligence of forest and stream into himself but i sometimes detected a little fun in his face which could yield to my sympathetic smile for he was thoroughly good-humoured we meanwhile scrambled along the shore with our packs without any path this was the last of our boating for the day the prevailing rock here was a kind of slate standing on its edges and my companion who was recently from california thought it exactly like that in which the gold is found and said that if he had had a pan he would have liked to wash a little of the sand here the indian now got along much faster than we and waited for us from time to time i found here the only cool spring that i drank at anywhere on this excursion a little water filling a hollow in the sandy bank it was a quite memorable event and due to the elevation of the country for wherever else we had been the water in the rivers and the streams emptying in was dead and warm compared with that of a mountainous region it was very bad walking along the shore over fallen and drifted trees and bushes and rocks from time to time swinging ourselves round over the water or else taking to a gravel bar or going inland at one place the indian being ahead i was obliged to take off all my clothes in order to ford a small but deep stream emptying in while my companion who was inland found a rude bridge high up in the woods and i saw no more of him for some time i saw there very fresh moose tracks found a new goldenrod to me perhaps solidago thersoidea and i passed one white pine log which had lodged in the forest near the edge of the stream which was quite five feet in diameter at the butt probably its size detained it shortly after this i overtook the indian at the edge of some burnt land which extended three or four miles at least beginning about three miles above second lake 
which we were expecting to reach that night and which is about ten miles from telos lake this burnt region was still more rocky than before but though comparatively open we could not yet see the lake not having seen my companion for some time i climbed with the indian a singular high rock on the edge of the river forming a narrow ridge only a foot or two wide at top in order to look for him and after calling many times i at length heard him answer from a considerable distance inland he having taken a trail which led off from the river perhaps directly to the lake and was now in search of the river again seeing a much higher rock of the same character about one-third of a mile farther east or downstream i proceeded toward it through the burnt land in order to look for the lake from its summit supposing that the indian would keep down the stream in his canoe and hallooing all the while that my companion might join me on the way before we came together i noticed where a moose which possibly i had scared by my shouting had apparently just run along a large rotten trunk of a pine which made a bridge thirty or forty feet long over a hollow as convenient for him as for me the tracks were as large as those of an ox but an ox could not have crossed there this burnt land was an exceedingly wild and desolate region judging by the weeds and sprouts it appeared to have been burnt about two years before it was covered with charred trunks either prostrate or standing which crocked our clothes and hands and we could not easily have distinguished a bear there by his colour great shells of trees sometimes unburnt without or burnt on one side only but black within stood twenty or forty feet high the fire had run up inside as in a chimney leaving the sapwood sometimes we crossed a rocky ravine fifty feet wide on a fallen trunk and there were great fields of fireweed epilobium angustifolium on all sides the most extensive that i ever saw which presented great masses of pink intermixed with these were blueberry and raspberry bushes having crossed a second rocky ridge like the first when i was beginning to ascend the third the indian whom i had left on the shore some fifty rods behind beckoned to me to come to him but i made sign that i would first ascend the highest rock before me whence i expected to see the lake my companion accompanied me to the top this was formed just like the others being struck with the perfect parallelism of these singular rock hills however much one might be in advance of another i took out my compass and found that they lay northwest and southeast the rock being on its edge and sharp edges they were this one to speak from memory was perhaps a third of a mile in length but quite narrow rising gradually from the northwest to the height of about eighty feet but steep on the southeast end the southwest side was as steep as an ordinary roof or as we could safely climb the northeast was an abrupt precipice from which you could jump clean to the bottom near which the river flowed while the level top of the ridge on which you walked along was only from one to three or four feet in width for a rude illustration take the half of a pear cut in two lengthwise lay it on its flat side the stem to the northwest and then have it vertically in the direction of its length keeping the southwest half such was the general form there was a remarkable series of these great rock waves revealed by the burning breakers as it were no wonder that the river that found its way through them was rapid and obstructed by falls no doubt the absence of soil on these rocks or its dryness where there was any caused this to be a very thorough burning we could see the lake over the woods two or three miles ahead and that the river made an abrupt turn southward around the northwest end of the cliff on which we stood or a little above us so that we had cut off a bend and that there was an important fall in it a short distance below us i could see the canoe a hundred rods behind but now on the opposite shore and supposed that the indian had concluded to take out and carry round some bad rapids on that side and that that might be what he had beckoned to me for but after waiting a while i could still see nothing of him and i observed to my companion that i wondered where he was though i began to suspect that he had gone inland to look for the lake from some hilltop on that side as we had done this proved to be the case for after i had started to return to the canoe i heard a faint halloo 
and descried him on the top of a distant rocky hill on that side but as after a long time had elapsed i still saw his canoe in the same place and he had not returned to it and appeared in no hurry to do so and moreover as i remembered that he had previously beckoned to me i thought that there might be something more to delay him than i knew and began to return northwest along the ridge toward the angle in the river my companion who had just been separated from us and had even contemplated the necessity of camping alone wishing to husband his steps and yet to keep with us inquired where i was going to which i answered that i was going far enough back to communicate with the indian and that then i thought we had better go along the shore together and keep him in sight when we reached the shore the indian appeared from out the woods on the opposite side but on account of the roar of the water it was difficult to communicate with him he kept along the shore westward to his canoe while we stopped at the angle where the stream turned southward along the precipice i again said to my companion that we would keep along the shore and keep the indian in sight we started to do so being close together the indian behind us having launched his canoe again but just then i saw the latter who had crossed to our side forty or fifty rods behind beckoning to me and i called to my companion who had just disappeared behind large rocks at the point of the precipice three or four rods before me on his way down the stream that i was going to help the indian a moment i did so helped get the canoe over a fall lying with my breast over a rock and holding one end while he received it below and within ten or fifteen minutes at most i was back again at the point where the river turned southward in order to catch up with my companion while polis glided down the river alone parallel with me but to my surprise when i rounded the precipice though the shore was bare of trees without rocks for a quarter of a mile at least my companion was not to be seen it was as if he had sunk into the earth this was the more unaccountable to me because i knew that his feet were since our swamp walk very sore and that he wished to keep with the party and besides this was very bad walking climbing over or about the rocks i hastened along hallooing and searching for him thinking that he might be concealed behind a rock yet doubting if he had not taken the other side of the precipice but the indian had got along still faster in his canoe till he was arrested by the falls about a quarter of a mile below he then landed and said that we could go no farther that night the sun was setting and on account of falls and rapids we should be obliged to leave this river and carry a good way into another farther east the first thing then was to find my companion for i was now very much alarmed about him and i sent the indian along the shore downstream which began to be covered with unburnt wood again just below the falls while i searched backward about the precipice which we had passed the indian showed some unwillingness to exert himself complaining that he was very tired in consequence of his day's work that it had strained him very much getting down so many rapids alone but he went off calling somewhat like an owl i remembered that my companion was near-sighted and i feared that he had either fallen from the precipice or fainted and sunk down amid the rocks beneath it i shouted and searched above and below this precipice in the twilight till i could not see expecting nothing less than to find his body beneath it for half an hour i anticipated and believed only the worst i thought what i should do the next day if i did not find him what i could do in such a wilderness and how his relatives would feel if i should return without him i felt that if he were really lost away from the river there it would be a desperate undertaking to find him and where were they who could help you what would it be to raise the country where there were only two or three camps twenty or thirty miles apart and no road and perhaps nobody at home yet we must try the harder the less the prospect of success i rushed down from this precipice to the canoe in order to fire the indian's gun but found that my companion had the caps i was still thinking of getting it off when the indian returned he had not found him but he said that he had seen his tracks once or twice along the shore this encouraged me very much he objected to firing the gun saying that if my companion heard it which was not likely on account of the roar of the stream it would tempt him to come toward us and he might break his neck in the dark for the same reason we refrained from lighting a fire on the highest rock 
i proposed that we should both keep down the stream to the lake or that i should go at any rate but the indian said no use can't do anything in the dark come morning then we find him no harm he make him camp no bad animals here no grisly bears such as in california where he's been warm night he well off as you and i i considered that if he was well he could do without us he had just lived eight years in california and had plenty of experience with wild beasts and wilder men was peculiarly accustomed to make journeys of great length but if he were sick or dead he was near where we were the darkness in the woods was by this so thick that it alone decided the question we must camp where we were i knew that he had his knapsack with blankets and matches and if well would fare no worse than we except that he would have no support nor society end of part three section twenty nine recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three section thirty of the maine woods by henry david thoreau this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three the allegash and east branch section thirty this side of the river being so encumbered with rocks we crossed to the eastern or smoother shore and proceeded to camp there within two or three rods of the falls we pitched no tent but lay on the sand putting a few handfuls of grass and twigs under us there being no evergreen at hand for fuel we had some of the charred stumps our various bags of provisions had got quite wet in the rapids and i arranged them about the fire to dry the fall close by was the principal one on this stream and it shook the earth under us it was a cool because dewy night the more so probably owing to the nearness of the falls the indian complained a good deal and thought afterward that he got a cold there which occasioned a more serious illness we were not much troubled by mosquitoes at any rate i lay awake a good deal from anxiety but unaccountably to myself was at length comparatively at ease respecting him at first i had apprehended the worst but now i had little doubt but that i should find him in the morning from time to time i fancied that i heard his voice calling through the roar of the falls from the opposite side of the river but it is doubtful if we could have heard him across the stream there sometimes i doubted whether the indian had really seen his tracks since he manifested an unwillingness to make much of a search and then my anxiety returned it was the most wild and desolate region we had camped in where if anywhere one might expect to meet with befitting inhabitants but i heard only the squeak of a night-hawk flitting over the moon in her first quarter in the forepart of the night setting over the bare rocky hills garnished with tall charred and hollow stumps or shells of trees served to reveal the desolation thursday july thirtieth i aroused the indian early this morning to go in search of our companion expecting to find him within a mile or two farther down the stream the indian wanted his breakfast first but i reminded him that my companion had had neither breakfast nor supper we were obliged first to carry our canoe and baggage over into another stream the main east branch about three-fourths of a mile distant for webster stream was no farther navigable we went twice over this carry and the dewy bushes wet us through like water up to the middle i hallooed in a high key from time to time though i had little expectation that i could be heard over the roar of the rapids and moreover we were necessarily on the opposite side of the stream to him in going over this portage the last time the indian who was before me with a canoe on his head stumbled and fell heavily once and lay for a moment silent as if in pain i hastily stepped forward to help him asking if he was much hurt but after a moment's pause without replying he sprang up and went forward he was all the way subject to taciturn fits but they were harmless ones we had launched our canoe and gone but little way down the east branch when i heard an answering shout from my companion and soon after saw him standing on a point where there was a clearing a quarter of a mile below and the smoke of his fire was rising near by before i saw him i naturally shouted again and again but the indian curtly remarked he hears you 
as if once was enough. It was just below the mouth of Webster Stream. When we arrived, he was smoking his pipe, and said that he had passed a pretty comfortable night, though it was rather cold on account of the dew. It appeared that when we stood together the previous evening, and I was shouting to the Indian across the river, he, being near-sighted, had not seen the Indian nor his canoe, and when I went back to the Indian's assistance, did not see which way I went, and supposed that we were below and not above him, and so, making haste to catch up, he ran away from us. Having reached this clearing a mile or more below our camp, the night overtook him, and he made a fire in a little hollow and lay down by it in his blanket, still thinking that we were ahead of him. He thought it likely that he had heard the Indian call once the evening before, but mistook it for an owl. He had seen one botanical rarity before it was dark, pure white epilobium angustifolium, amidst the fields of pink ones in the burnt lands. He had already stuck up the remnant of a lumberer's shirt bound on the point on a pole by the waterside for a signal and attached a note to it to inform us that he had gone on to the lake and that if he did not find us there he would be back in a couple of hours if he had not found us soon he had some thoughts of going back in search of the solitary hunter whom we had met at telos lake ten miles behind and if successful hire him to take him to bangor but if this hunter had moved as fast as we, he would have been twenty miles off by this time, and who could guess in what direction? It would have been like looking for a needle in a haymow to search for him in these woods. He had been considering how long he could live on berries alone. We substituted for his note a card containing our names and destination, and the date of our visit, which Polis neatly enclosed in a piece of birch bark to keep it dry this has probably been read by some hunter or explorer ere this we all had good appetites for the breakfast which we made haste to cook here and then having partially dried our clothes we glided swiftly down the winding stream towards second lake as the shores became flatter with frequent gravel and sandbars and the stream more winding in the lower land near the lake elms and ash trees made their appearance also the wild yellow lily lilium canadense some of whose bulbs i collected for a soup on some ridges the burnt land extended as far as the lake this was a very beautiful lake two or three miles long with high mountains on the southwest side the as our indian said nurlum's kishtikuk that is deadwater mountain it appears to be the same called carbuncle mountain on the map according to polis it extends in separate elevations all along this and the next lake which is much larger the lake too i think is called by the same name or perhaps with the addition of gamak or mook the morning was a bright one and perfectly still and serene the lake as smooth as glass we making the only ripple as we paddled into it the dark mountains about it were seen through a glaucous mist and the brilliant white stems of canoe birches mingled with the other woods around it the wood thrush sang on the distant shore and the laugh of some loons sporting in a concealed western bay as if inspired by the morning came distinct over the lake to us and what was more remarkable the echo which ran round the lake was much louder than the original note probably because the loon being in a regularly curving bay under the mountain we were exactly in the focus of many echoes the sound being reflected like light from a concave mirror the beauty of the scene may have been enhanced to our eyes by the fact that we had just come together again after a night of some anxiety this reminded me of the ambidigis lake on the west branch which i crossed in my first coming to maine having paddled down three quarters of the lake we came to a standstill while my companion let down for fish a white or whitish gull sat on a rock which rose above the surface in mid-lake not far off quite in harmony with the scene and as we rested there in the warm sun we heard one loud crushing or crackling sound from the forest forty or fifty rods distant as of a stick broken by the foot of some large animal even this was an interesting incident there in the midst of our dreams of giant lake trout even then supposed to be nibbling our fishermen drew up a diminutive red perch and we took up our paddles again in haste it was not apparent where the outlet of this lake was 
and while the Indian thought it was in one direction, I thought it was in another. He said, I bet you four pence it is there, but he still held on in my direction, which proved to be the right one. As we were approaching the outlet, it being still early in the forenoon, he suddenly exclaimed, Moose, moose, and told us to be still. He put a cap on his gun, and standing up in the stern, rapidly pushed the canoe straight toward the shore and the moose. It was a cow moose, about thirty rods off, standing in the water by the side of the outlet, partly behind some fallen timber and bushes, and at that distance she did not look very large. She was flapping her large ears, and from time to time poking off the flies with her nose from some part of her body. She did not appear much alarmed by our neighborhood, only occasionally turned her head and looked straight at us, and then gave her attention to the flies again. As we approached nearer, she got out of the water, stood higher, and regarded us more suspiciously. Polis pushed the canoe steadily forward in the shallow water, and I for a moment forgot the moose in attending to some pretty rose-colored polygonums just rising above the surface. But the canoe soon grounded in the mud eight or ten rods distant from the moose, and the Indian seized his gun and prepared to fire. After standing still a moment, she turned slowly, as usual, so as to expose her side, and he improved this moment to fire over our heads. She thereupon moved off eight or ten rods at a moderate pace across a shallow bay to an old standing place of hers behind some fallen red maples on the opposite shore, and there she stood still again a dozen or fourteen rods from us, while the Indian hastily loaded and fired twice at her without her moving. My companion, who passed him his caps and bullets, said that Polis was as excited as a boy of fifteen, that his hand trembled, and he once put his ramrod back upside down. This was remarkable for so experienced a hunter. Perhaps he was anxious to make a good shot before us. The white hunter had told me that the Indians were not good shots, because they were excited, though he said that we had got a good hunter with us. The Indian now pushed quickly and quietly back, and a long distance round in order to get into the outlet, for he had fired over the neck of a peninsula between it and the lake, till we approached the place where the moose had stood, when he exclaimed, She is a goner, and was surprised that we did not see her as soon as he did. There, to be sure, she lay perfectly dead, with her tongue hanging out, just where she had stood to receive the last shots, looking unexpectedly large and horse-like, and we saw where the bullets had scarred the trees. Using a tape, I found that the moose measured just six feet, from the shoulder to the tip of the hoof, and was eight feet long as she lay. Some portions of the body, for a foot in diameter, were almost covered with flies, apparently the common fly of our woods, with a dark spot on the wing, and not the very large ones which occasionally pursued us in midstream, though both are called moose flies. Polis, preparing to skin the moose, asked me to help him find a stone on which to sharpen his large knife. It being all a flat alluvial ground where the moose had fallen, covered with red maples, etc., this was no easy matter. We searched far and wide a long time, till at length I found a flat kind of slate stone, and soon after he returned with a similar one on which he soon made his knife very sharp. While he was skinning the moose, I proceeded to ascertain what kind of fishes were to be found in the sluggish and muddy outlet. The greatest difficulty was to find a pole. It was almost impossible to find a slender straight pole ten or feet long in those woods. You might search half an hour in vain. They are commonly spruce, arbor vitae, fir, etc., short, stout, and branchy, and do not make good fish poles even after you have patiently cut off all their tough and scraggy branches. The fishes were red perch and kiven. The Indian, having cut off a large piece of sirloin, the upper lip and the tongue, wrapped them in the hide, and placed them in the bottom of the canoe, observing that there was one man, meaning the weight of one. Our load had previously been reduced some thirty pounds, but a hundred pounds were now added, a serious addition, which made our quarters still more narrow, and considerably increased the danger on the lakes and rapids, as well as the labor of the carries. The skin was ours according to custom, since the Indian was in our employ, but we did not think of claiming it. He being a skillful dresser of moose hides would make it worth seven or eight dollars to him, as I was told. 
He said that he sometimes earned fifty or sixty dollars in a day at them. He had killed ten moose in one day, though the skinning and all took two days. This was the way he had got his property. There were the tracks of a calf thereabouts, which he said would come by by, and he could get it if we cared to wait, but I cast cold water on the project. We continued along the outlet toward Grand Lake, through a swampy region, by a long, winding, and narrow dead water, very much choked up by wood, where we were obliged to land sometimes in order to get the canoe over a log. It was hard to find any channel, and we did not know but we should be lost in the swamp. It abounded in ducks, as usual. At length we reached Grand Lake, which the Indian called Matangamuk. At the head of this we saw, coming in from the southwest, with a sweep apparently from a gorge in the mountains, Trout Stream, or Un Cardner Hezi, which name, the Indian said, had something to do with mountains. We stopped to dine on an interesting high rocky island, soon after entering Matangamuk Lake, securing our canoe to the cliffy shore. It is always pleasant to step from a boat onto a large rock or cliff. Here was a good opportunity to dry our dewy blankets on the open sunny rock. Indians had recently camped here and accidentally burned over the western end of the island, and Polis picked up a gun case of blue broadcloth and said that he knew the Indian it belonged to and would carry it to him. His tribe is not so large, but he may know all its effects. We proceeded to make a fire and cook our dinner amid some pines, where our predecessors had done the same, while the Indian busied himself about his moose hide on the shore, for he said that he thought it a good plan for one to do all the cooking, that is, I suppose, if that one were not himself. A peculiar evergreen overhung our fire, which at first glance looked like a pitch pine, P. rigida, with leaves little more than an inch long, spruce-like, but we found it to be the Pinus banksiana, banks or the Labrador pine, also called scrub pine, gray pine, etc., a new tree to us. These must have been good specimens, for several were thirty or thirty-five feet high. Richardson found it forty feet high and upward, and states that the porcupine feeds on its bark. Here also grew the red pine. I saw where the Indians had made canoes in a little secluded hollow in the woods, on the top of the rock where they were out of the wind, and large piles of whittlings remained. This must have been a favorite resort for their ancestors, and indeed we found here the point of an arrowhead, such as they have not used for two centuries, and now know not how to make. The Indian, picking up a stone, remarked to me, That very strange lock, or rock, it was a piece of hornstone, which I told him his tribe had probably brought here, centuries before to make arrowheads of he also picked up a yellowish curved bone by the side of our fireplace and asked me to guess what it was it was one of the upper incisors of a beaver on which some party had feasted within a year or two i found also most of the teeth and the skull etc we here dined on fried moose meat one who was my companion in my two previous excursions to these woods tells me that when hunting up the caucomgomoc about two years ago, he found himself dining one day on moose meat, mud turtle, trout, and beaver, and he thought that there were few places in the world where these dishes could easily be brought together on one table. End of Part 3, Section 30 Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine Part three, section thirty one of the Maine Woods by Henry David Thoreau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, the Allegash and East Branch, section thirty one. After the almost incessant rapids and falls of the Madunkchunk, Height of Land or Webster Stream, we had just passed through the deadwater of Second Lake and were now in the much larger dead water of grand lake and i thought the indian was entitled to take an extra nap here katahdin near which we were to pass the next day is said to mean highest land so much geography is there in their names the indian navigator naturally distinguishes by a name those parts of a stream where he has encountered quick water and forks and again the lakes and smooth water where he can rest his weary arms since those are the most interesting and more arable parts to him 
the very sight of the nurlums kichtikuk or deadwater mountains a day's journey off over the forest as we first saw them must awaken in him pleasing memories and not less interesting is it to the white traveller when he is crossing a placid lake in these out-of-the-way woods perhaps thinking that he is in some sense one of the earlier discoverers of it to be reminded that it was thus well known and suitably named by indian hunters perhaps a thousand years ago ascending the precipitous rock which formed this long narrow island i was surprised to find that its summit was a narrow ridge with a precipice on one side and that its axis of elevation extended from northwest to southeast exactly like that of the great rocky ridge at the commencement of the burnt ground ten miles northwesterly the same arrangement prevailed here and we could plainly see that the mountain ridges on the west of the lake trended the same way splendid large harebells nodded over the edge and in the clefts of the cliff and the blueberries vaccinium canadense were for the first time really abundant in the thin soil on its top there was no lack of them henceforward on the east branch there was a fine view hence over the sparkling lake which looked pure and deep and had two or three in all rocky islands in it our blankets being dry we set out again the indian as usual having left his gazette on a tree this time it was we three in a canoe my companion smoking we paddled southward down this handsome lake which appeared to extend nearly as far east as south keeping near the western shore just outside a small island under the dark nurlums kichtikuk mountain for i had observed on my map that this was the course it was three or four miles across it it struck me that the outline of this mountain on the southwest of the lake and of another beyond it was not only like that of the huge rock waves of webster stream but in the main like kineo on moosehead lake having a similar but less abrupt precipice at the southeast end in short that all the prominent hills and ridges hereabouts were larger or smaller kineos and that possibly there was such a relation between kineo and the rocks of webster stream the indian did not know exactly where the outlet was whether at the extreme southwest angle or more easterly and had asked to see my plan at the last stopping place but i had forgotten to show it to him as usual he went feeling his way by a middle course between two probable points from which he could diverge either way at last without losing much distance in approaching the south shore as the clouds looked gusty and the waves ran pretty high we so steered as to get partly under the lee of an island though at a greater distance from it i could not distinguish the outlet till we were almost in it and heard the water falling over the dam there here was a considerable fall and a very substantial dam but no sign of a cabin or camp the hunter whom we met at telos lake had told us that there were plenty of trout here but at this hour they did not rise to the bait only cousin trout from the very midst of the rushing waters there are not so many fishes in these rivers as in the concord while we loitered here polis took occasion to cut with his big knife some of the hair from his moose hide and so lightened and prepared it for drying i noticed at several old indian camps in the woods the pile of hair which they had cut from their hides having carried over the dam he darted down the rapids leaving us to walk for a mile or more where for the most part there was no path but very thick and difficult travelling near the stream at length he would call to let us know where he was waiting for us with his canoe when on account of the windings of the stream we did not know where the shore was but he did not call often enough forgetting that we were not indians he seemed to be very saving of his breath yet he would be surprised if we went by or did not strike the right spot this was not because he was unaccommodating but a proof of superior manners indians like to get along with the least possible communication and ado he was really paying us a great compliment all the while thinking that we preferred a hint to a kick at length climbing over the willows and fallen trees when this was easier than to go round or under them we overtook the canoe and glided down the stream in smooth but swift water for several miles i here observed again as at webster stream 
and on a still larger scale the next day that the river was a smooth and regularly inclined plain down which we coasted as we thus glided along we started the first black ducks which we had distinguished we decided to camp early to-night that we might have ample time before dark so we stopped at the first favorable shore where there was a narrow gravelly beach on the western side some five miles below the outlet of the lake it was an interesting spot where the river began to make a great bend to the east and the last of the peculiar moose-faced nerlum kichtikuk mountains not far southwest of grand lake rose dark in the southwest a short distance behind displaying its gray precipitous southeast side but we could not see this without coming out upon the shore two steps from the water on either side and you come to the abrupt bushy and rooty if not turfy edge of the bank four or five feet high where the interminable forest begins as if the stream had but just cut its way through it it is surprising on stepping ashore anywhere into this unbroken wilderness to see so often at least within a few rods of the river the marks of the axe made by lumberers who have either camped here or driven logs past in previous springs you will see perchance where going on the same errand that you do they have cut large chips from a tall white pine stump for their fire while we were pitching the camp and getting supper the indian cut the rest of the hair from his moose hide and proceeded to extend it vertically on a temporary frame between two small trees half a dozen feet from the opposite side of the fire lashing and stretching it with arbor vitae bark which was always at hand and in this case was stripped from one of the trees it was tied to asking for a new kind of tea he made us some pretty good of the checkerberry which covered the ground dropping a little bunch of it tied up with cedar bark into the kettle but it was not quite equal to the chiogenes we called this therefore checkerberry tea camp i was struck with the abundance of the linnea borealis checkerberry and chiogenes hispidula almost everywhere in the main woods the wintergreen chimophila umbellata was still in bloom here and clintonia berries were abundant and ripe this handsome plant is one of the most common in that forest we here first noticed the moose wood in fruit on the banks the prevailing trees were spruce commonly black arbor vitae canoe birch black ash and elms beginning to appear yellow birch red maple and a little hemlock skulking in the forest the indian said that the white maple punk was the best for tinder the yellow birch punk was pretty good but hard after supper he put on the moose tongue and lips to boil cutting out the septum he showed me how to write on the under side of birch bark with a black spruce twig which is hard and tough and can be brought to a point the indian wandered off into the woods a short distance just before night and coming back said me found great treasure fifty sixty dollars worth what's that we asked steel traps under a log thirty or forty i didn't count em i guess indian work worth three dollars apiece it was a singular coincidence that he should have chanced to walk to and look under that particular log in that trackless forest i saw chivin and chub in the stream when washing my hands but my companion tried in vain to catch them i also heard the sound of bullfrogs from a swamp on the opposite side thinking at first that they were moose a duck paddled swiftly by and sitting in that dusky wilderness under that dark mountain by the bright river which was full of reflected light still i heard the wood thrush sing as if no higher civilization could be attained by this time the night was upon us you commonly make your camp just at sundown and are collecting wood gathering your supper or pitching your tent while the shades of night are gathering around and adding to the already dense gloom of the forest you have no time to explore or look around you before it is dark you may penetrate half a dozen rods farther into that twilight wilderness after some dry bark to kindle your fire with and wonder what mysteries lie hidden still deeper in it say at the end of a long day's walk or you may run down to the shore for a dipper of water and get a clearer view for a short distance up or down the stream and while you stand there see a fish leap or duck alight in the river or hear a wood thrush or robin sing in the woods 
that is as if you had been to town or civilized parts but there is no sauntering off to see the country and ten or fifteen rods seems a great way from your companions and you come back with the air of a much-travelled man as from a long journey with adventures to relate though you may have heard the crackling of the fire all the while and at a hundred rods you might be lost past recovery and have to camp out it is all mossy and moosey in some of those dense fir and spruce woods there is hardly room for the smoke to go up the trees are a standing night and every fir or spruce which you fell is a plume plucked from night's raven wing then at night the general stillness is more impressive than any sound but occasionally you hear the note of an owl farther or nearer in the woods and if near a lake the semi-human cry of the loons at their unearthly revels to-night the indian lay between the fire and his stretched moose-hide to avoid the mosquitoes indeed he also made a small smoky fire of damp leaves at his head and his feet and then as usual rolled up his head in his blanket we with our veils and our wash were tolerably comfortable but it would be difficult to pursue any sedentary occupation in the woods at this season you cannot see to read much by the light of a fire through a veil in the evening nor handle pencil and paper well with gloves or anointed fingers friday july thirty first the indian said you and i kill moose last night therefore use em best wood always use hard wood to cook moose meat his best wood was rock maple he cast the moose's lip into the fire to burn the hair off and then rolled it up with the meat to carry along observing that we were sitting down to breakfast without any pork he said with a very grave look me want some fat so he was told that he might have as much as he would fry we had smooth but swift water for a considerable distance where we glided rapidly along scaring up ducks and kingfishers but as usual our smooth progress ere long came to an end and we were obliged to carry canoe and all about half a mile down the right bank around some rapids or falls it required sharp eyes sometimes to tell which side was the carry before you went over the falls but polis never failed to land us rightly the raspberries were particularly abundant and large here and all hands went to eating them the indian remarking on their size often on bare rocky carries the trail was so indistinct that i repeatedly lost it but when i walked behind him i observed that he could keep it almost like a hound and rarely hesitated or if he paused a moment on a bare rock his eye immediately detected some sign which would have escaped me frequently we found no path at all in these places and were to him unaccountably delayed he would only say it was ver strange we had heard of a grand fall on this stream and thought that each fall we came to must be it but after christening several in succession with this name we gave up the search there were more grand or petty falls than i can remember i cannot tell how many times we had to walk on account of falls or rapids we were expecting all the while that the river would take a final leap and get to smooth water but there was no improvement this forenoon however the carries were an agreeable variety so surely as we stepped out of the canoe and stretched our legs we found ourselves in a blueberry and raspberry garden each side of our rocky trail around the falls being lined with one or both there was not a carry on the main east branch where we did not find an abundance of both these berries for these were the rockiest places and partially cleared such as these plants prefer and there had been none to gather the finest before us in our three journeys over the carries for we were obliged to go over the ground three times whenever the canoe was taken out we did full justice to the berries and they were just what we wanted to correct the effect of our hard bread and pork diet another name for making a portage would have been going a burying we also found a few amelanchier or service berries though most were abortive but they held on rather more generally than they do in concord the indian called them pomoimenuk and said that they bore much fruit in some places he sometimes also ate the northern wild red cherries saying that they were good medicine but they were scarcely edible we bathed and dined at the foot of one of these carries it was the indian who commonly reminded us that it was dinner-time sometimes even by turning the prow to the shore 
He once made an indirect but lengthy apology by saying that we might think it strange, but that one who worked hard all day was very particular to have his dinner in good season. At the most considerable fall on this stream, when I was walking over the carry close behind the Indian, he observed a track on the rock which was but slightly covered with soil, and stooping muttered, caribou. When we returned, he observed a much larger track near the same place where some animal's foot had sunk into a small hollow in the rock, partly filled with grass and earth, and he exclaimed with surprise, what that? Well, what is it? I asked stooping and laying his hand in it he answered with a mysterious air and in a half whisper devil that is indian devil or cougar ledges about here very bad animal pull em rocks all to pieces how long since it was made i asked to-day or yesterday said he but when i asked him afterward if he was sure it was the devil's track he said he did not know i had been told that the scream of a cougar was heard about katahdin recently and we were not far from that mountain. End of part three, section thirty one. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three, section thirty two of the Maine Woods by Henry David Thoreau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part three the allegash and east branch section thirty two we spent at least half the time in walking to-day and the walking was as bad as usual for the indian being alone commonly ran down far below the foot of the carries before he waited for us the carry paths themselves were more than usually indistinct often the route being revealed only by the countless small holes in the fallen timber made by the tacks in the driver's boots or where there was a slight trail we did not find it it was a tangled and perplexing thicket through which we stumbled and threaded our way and when we had finished a mile of it our starting point seemed far away we were glad that we had not got to walk to bangor along the banks of this river which would be a journey of more than a hundred miles think of the denseness of the forest the fallen trees and rocks the windings of the river the streams emptying in and the frequent swamps to be crossed it made you shudder yet the indian from time to time pointed out to us where he had thus crept along day after day when he was a boy of ten and in a starving condition he had been hunting far north of this with two grown indians the winter came on unexpectedly early and the ice compelled them to leave their canoe at grand lake and walk down the bank they shouldered their furs and started for old town the snow was not deep enough for snowshoes or to cover the inequalities of the ground polis was soon too weak to carry any burden but he managed to catch one otter this was the most they all had to eat on this journey and he remembered how good the yellow lily roots were made into a soup with the otter oil he shared this food equally with the other two but being so small he suffered much more than they he waded through the matawamkeg at its mouth when it was freezing cold and came up to his chin and he being very weak and emaciated expected to be swept away the first house which they reached was at lincoln and thereabouts they met a white teamster with supplies who seeing their condition gave them as much of his load as they could eat for six months after getting home he was very low and did not expect to live and was perhaps always the worse for it we could not find much more than half of this day's journey on our maps the map of the public lands of maine and massachusetts and colton's railroad and township map of maine which copies the former by the maps there was not more than fifteen miles between camps at the outside and yet we had been busily progressing all day and much of the time very rapidly for seven or eight miles below that succession of grand falls the aspect of the banks as well as the character of the stream was changed after passing a tributary from the northeast perhaps bolin stream we had good swift smooth water with a regular slope such as i have described low grassy banks and muddy shores began many elms as well as maples and more ash trees overhung the stream and supplanted the spruce my lily roots having been lost when the canoe was taken out at a carry 
i landed late in the afternoon at a low and grassy place amid maples to gather more it was slow work grubbing them up amid the sand and the mosquitoes were all the while feasting on me mosquitoes black flies etc pursued us in mid-channel and we were glad sometimes to get into violent rapids for then we escaped them a red-headed woodpecker flew across the river and the indian remarked that it was good to eat as we glided swiftly down the inclined plane of the river a great cat owl launched itself away from a stump on the bank and flew heavily across the stream and the indian as usual imitated its note soon the same bird flew back in front of us and we afterwards passed it perched on a tree soon afterward a white-headed eagle sailed down the stream before us we drove him several miles while we were looking for a good place to camp for we expected to be overtaken by a shower and still we could distinguish him by his white tail sailing away from time to time from some tree by the shore still farther down the stream some shikorways being surprised by us a part of them dived and we passed directly over them and could trace their course here and there by a bubble on the surface but we did not see them come up polis detected once or twice what he called a tow road an indistinct path leading into the forest in the meanwhile we passed the mouth of the Seboyus on our left this did not look so large as our stream which was indeed the main one it was some time before we found a camping place for the shore was either too grassy and muddy where mosquitoes abounded or too steep a hillside the indians said that there were but few mosquitoes on a steep hillside we examined a good place where somebody had camped a long time but it seemed pitiful to occupy an old site where there was so much room to choose so we continued on we at length found a place to our minds on the west bank about a mile below the mouth of the Seboyus, where in a very dense spruce wood above a gravelly shore there seemed to be but few insects the trees were so thick that we were obliged to clear a space to build our fire and lie down in and the young spruce trees that were left were like the wall of an apartment rising around us we were obliged to pull ourselves up a steep bank to get there but the place which you have selected for your camp though never so rough and grim begins at once to have its attractions and becomes a very centre of civilization to you home is home be it never so homely it turned out that the mosquitoes were more numerous here than we had found them before and the indian complained a good deal though he lay as the night before between three fires in his stretched hide as i sat on a stump by the fire with a veil and gloves on trying to read he observed i make you candle and in a minute he took a piece of birch bark about two inches wide and rolled it hard like an alumet fifteen inches long lit it and fixed it by the other end horizontally in a split stick three feet high stuck it in the ground turning the blazing end to the wind and telling me to snuff it from time to time it answered the purpose of a candle pretty well i noticed as i had done before that there was a lull among the mosquitoes about midnight and that they began again in the morning nature is thus merciful but apparently they need rest as well as we few if any creatures are equally active all night as soon as it was light i saw through my veil that the inside of the tent about our heads was quite blackened with myriads each one of their wings when flying as has been calculated vibrating some three thousand times in a minute and their combined hum was almost as bad to endure as their stings i had an uncomfortable night on this account though i am not sure that one succeeded in his attempt to sting me we did not suffer so much from insects on this excursion as the statements of some who have explored these woods in midsummer led us to anticipate yet i have no doubt that at some seasons and in some places they are a much more serious pest the jesuit hiron l'allemand of quebec reporting the death of father Rene menard who was abandoned lost his way and died in the woods among the ontarios near lake superior in sixteen sixty one dwells chiefly on his probable sufferings from the attacks of mosquitoes when too weak to defend himself adding that there was a frightful number of them in those parts and so insupportable says he that the three frenchmen who have made that voyage affirm that there was no other means of defending oneself but to run always without stopping and it was even necessary for two of them to be employed 
in driving off these creatures while the third wanted to drink otherwise he could not have done it i have no doubt that this was said in good faith august first i caught two or three large red chivin lucissus pulchellus early this morning within twenty feet of the camp which added to the moose tongue that had been left in the kettle boiling overnight and to our other stores made a sumptuous breakfast the indian made us some hemlock tea instead of coffee and we were not obliged to go as far as china for it indeed not quite so far as for the fish this was tolerable though he said it was not strong enough it was interesting to see so simple a dish as a kettle of water with a handful of green hemlock sprigs in it boiling over the huge fire in the open air the leaves fast losing their lively green colour and know that it was for our breakfast we were glad to embark once more and leave some of the mosquitoes behind we had passed the wasatacoyuk without perceiving it this according to the indian is the name of the main east branch itself and not properly applied to this small tributary alone is on the maps we found that we had camped about a mile above hunts which is on the east bank and is the last house for those who ascend katahdin on this side we had expected to ascend it from this point but my companion was obliged to give up this on account of sore feet the indian however suggested that perhaps he might get a pair of moccasins at this place and that he could walk very easily in them without hurting his feet wearing several pairs of stockings and he said beside that they were so porous that when you had taken in water it all drained out again in a little while we stopped to get some sugar but found that the family had moved away and the house was unoccupied except temporarily by some men who were getting the hay they told me that the road to katahdin left the river eight miles above also that perhaps we could get some sugar at fisk's fourteen miles below i do not remember that we saw the mountain at all from the river i noticed a seine here stretched on the bank which probably had been used to catch salmon just below this on the west bank we saw a moose hide stretched and with it a bearskin which was comparatively very small i was the more interested in this sight because it was near here that a townsman of ours then quite a lad and alone killed a large bear some years ago the indian said that they belonged to joe Etienne, my last guide but how he told i do not know he was probably hunting near and had left them for the day finding that we were going directly to old town he regretted that he had not taken more of the moose meat to his family saying that in a short time by drying it he could have made it so light as to have brought away the greater part leaving the bones we once or twice inquired after the lip which is a famous tidbit but he said that go old town for my old woman don't get it every day maples grew more and more numerous it was lowering and rained a little during the forenoon and as we expected a wedding we stopped early and dined on the east side of a small expansion of the river just above what are probably called whetstone falls about a dozen miles below hunts there were pretty fresh moose tracks by the waterside there were singular long ridges hereabouts called horsebacks covered with ferns my companion having lost his pipe asked the indian if he could not make him one oh you're said he and in a minute rolled up one of birch bark telling him to wet the bowl from time to time here also he left his gazette on a tree we carried round the falls just below on the west side the rocks were on their edges and very sharp the distance was about three-fourths of a mile when we had carried over one load the indian returned by the shore and i by the path and though i made no particular haste i was nevertheless surprised to find him at the other end as soon as i it was remarkable how easily he got along over the worst ground he said to me i take canoe and you take the rest suppose you can keep along with me i thought that he meant that while he ran down the rapids i should keep along the shore and be ready to assist him from time to time as i had done before but as the walking would be very bad i answered i suppose you will go too fast for me but i will try but i was to go by the path he said this i thought would not help the matter i should have so far to go to get to the riverside when he wanted me but neither was this what he meant he was proposing a race over the carry and asked me if i thought i could keep along with him by the same path adding that i must be pretty smart to do it as his load the canoe would be much the heaviest and bulkiest though the simplest i thought that i ought to be able to do it and said that i would try 
so i proceeded to gather up the gun axe paddle kettle frying-pan plates dippers carpets etc etc and while i was thus engaged he threw me his cowhide boots what are these in the bargain i asked oh you said he but before i could make a bundle of my load i saw him disappearing over a hill with a canoe on his head so hastily scraping the various articles together i started on the run and immediately went by him in the bushes but i had no sooner left him out of sight in a rocky hollow than the greasy plates dippers etc took to themselves wings and while i was employed in gathering them up again he went by me but hastily pressing the sooty kettle to my side i started once more and soon passing him again i saw him no more on the carry i do not mention this as anything of a feat for it was but poor running on my part and he was obliged to move with great caution for fear of breaking his canoe as well as his neck when he made his appearance puffing and panting like myself in answer to my inquiries where he had been he said rocks locks cut em feet and laughing added oh me love to play sometimes he said that he and his companions when they came to carry several miles long used to try who would get over first each perhaps with a canoe on his head i bore the sign of the kettle on my brown linen sack for the rest of the voyage we made a second carry on the west side around some falls about a mile below this on the mainland were norway pines indicating a new geological formation and it was such a dry and sandy soil as we had not noticed before as we approached the mouth of the east branch we passed two or three huts the first sign of civilization after hunts though we saw no road as yet we heard a cow-bell and even an infant held up to a small square window to see us pass but apparently the infant and the mother that held it were the only inhabitants then at home for several miles this took the wind out of our sails reminding us that we were travellers surely while it was a native of the soil and had the advantage of us conversation flagged i would only hear the indian perhaps ask my companion you load my pipe he said that he smoked alder bark for medicine on entering the west branch at nicketow it appeared much larger than the east polis remarked that the former was all gone and lost now that it was all smooth water hence to old town and he threw away his pole which was cut on the umbazookskus thinking of the rapids he said once or twice that you wouldn't catch him to go east branch again but he did not by any means mean all that he said things are quite changed since i was here eleven years ago where there were but one or two houses i now found quite a village with sawmills and a store the latter was locked but its contents were so much the more safely stored and there was a stage road to matawamkeg and the rumour of a stage indeed a steamer had ascended thus far once when the water was very high but we were not able to get any sugar only a better shingle to lean our backs against we camped about two miles below nicketow on the south side of the west branch covering with fresh twigs the withered bed of a former traveller and feeling that we were now in a settled country especially when in the evening we heard an ox sneeze in its wild pasture across the river wherever you land along the frequented part of the river you have not far to go to find these sites of temporary inns the weathered bed of flattened twigs the charred sticks and perhaps the tent poles and not long since similar beds were spread along the connecticut the hudson and the delaware and longer still ago by the thames and seine and they now help to make the soil where private and public gardens mansions and palaces are we could not get fir twigs for our bed here and the spruce was harsh in comparison having more twig in proportion to its leaf but we improved it somewhat with hemlock the indian remarked as before must have hard wood to cook moose meat as if that were a maxim and proceeded to get it my companion cooked some in california fashion winding a long string of the meat round a stick and slowly turning it in his hand before the fire it was very good but the indian not approving of the mode or because he was not allowed to cook it his own way would not taste it after the regular supper we attempted to make a lily soup of the bulbs which i had brought along for i wished to learn all i could before i got out of the woods following the indian's directions for he began to be sick i washed the bulbs carefully minced some moose meat and some pork salted and boiled all together but we had not patience to try the experiment fairly 
for he said it must be boiled till the roots were completely softened so as to thicken the soup like flour but though we left it on all night we found it dried to the kettle in the morning and not yet boiled to a flour perhaps the roots were not ripe enough for they commonly gather them in the fall as it was it was palatable enough but it reminded me of the irishman's limestone broth the other ingredients were enough alone the indian's name for these bulbs was sheepnock stirred the soup by accident with a striped maple or moosewood stick which i had peeled and he remarked that its bark was an emetic he prepared to camp as usual between his moose hide and the fire but it beginning to rain suddenly he took refuge under the tent with us and gave us a song before falling asleep it rained hard in the night and spoiled another box of matches for us which the indian had left out for he was very careless but as usual we had so much the better night for the rain since it kept the mosquitoes down end of part three section thirty two recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three section thirty three of the maine woods by henry david thoreau this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by expatriate in bangor maine part three the allegash and east branch section thirty three sunday august second was a cloudy and unpromising morning one of us observed to the indian you did not stretch your moose hide last night did you mr polis whereat he replied in a tone of surprise though perhaps not of ill humour what you ask me that question for suppose i stretch him you see him maybe your way talking may be all right no indian way i had observed that he did not wish to answer the same question more than once and was often silent when it was put again for the sake of certainty as if he were moody not that he was incommunicative for he frequently commenced a long-winded narrative of his own accord repeated at length the tradition of some old battle or some passage in the recent history of his tribe in which he had acted a prominent part from time to time drawing a long breath and resuming the thread of his tale with the true story-teller's leisureliness perhaps after shooting a rapid prefacing with well bye-bye etc as he paddled along especially after the day's work was over and he had put himself in posture for the night he would be unexpectedly sociable exhibit even the bonhomie of a frenchman and we would fall asleep before he got through his periods nikitao is called eleven miles from matawamkeg by the river our camp was therefore about nine miles from the latter place the indian was quite sick this morning with the colic i thought that he was the worse for the moose meat he had eaten we reached the matawamkeg at half past eight in the morning in the midst of a drizzling rain and after buying some sugar set out again the indian growing much worse we stopped in the north part of lincoln to get some brandy for him but failing in this an apothecary recommended brandreth's pills which he refused to take because he was not acquainted with them he said to me me doctor first study my case find out what ail em, then i know what to take we dropped down a little farther and stopped at mid forenoon on an island and made him a dipper of tea here too we dined and did some washing and botanizing while he lay on the bank in the afternoon we went on a little farther though the indian was no better burntibus as he called it was a long smooth lake-like reach below the five islands he said that he owned a hundred acres somewhere up this way as a thunder shower appeared to be coming up we stopped opposite a barn on the west bank in chester about a mile above lincoln here at last we were obliged to spend the rest of the day and night on account of our patient whose sickness did not abate he lay groaning under his canoe on the bank looking very woebegone yet it was only a common case of colic you would not have thought if you had seen him lying about thus that he was the proprietor of so many acres in that neighborhood was worth six thousand dollars and had been to washington it seemed to me that like the irish he made a greater ado about his sickness than a yankee does and was more alarmed about himself we talked somewhat of leaving him with his people in lincoln for that is one of their homes and taking the stage the next day but he objected on account of the expense saying suppose me well in morning you and i go old town by noon 
as we were taking our tea at twilight while he lay groaning still under his canoe having at length found out what ailed him he asked me to get him a dipper of water taking the dipper in one hand he seized his powder horn with the other and pouring into it a charge or two of powder stirred it up with his finger and drank it off this was all he took to-day after breakfast beside his tea to save the trouble of pitching our tent when we had secured our stores from wandering dogs we camped in the solitary half-open barn near the bank with the permission of the owner lying on new-mown hay four feet deep the fragrance of the hay in which many ferns etc were mingled was agreeable though it was quite alive with grasshoppers which you could hear crawling through it this served to graduate our approach to houses and feather beds in the night some large bird probably an owl flitted through over our heads and very early in the morning we were awakened by the twittering of swallows which had their nests there monday august third we started early before breakfast the indian being considerably better and soon glided by lincoln and after another long and handsome lake-like reach we stopped to breakfast on the west shore two or three miles below this town we frequently passed indian islands with their small houses on them the governor Etion, lives in one of them in lincoln the penobscot indians seem to be more social even than the whites ever and anon in the deepest wilderness of maine you come to the log hut of a yankee or canada settler but a penobscot never takes up his residence in such a solitude they are not even scattered about on their islands in the penobscot which are all within the settlements but gathered together on two or three though not always on the best soil evidently for the sake of society i saw one or two houses not now used by them because as our indian polis said they were too solitary the small river emptying in at lincoln is the matanancook which also we noticed was the name of a steamer moored there so we paddled and floated along looking into the mouths of rivers when passing the mohawk rips or as the indian called them mohawk lips four or five miles below lincoln he told us at length the story of a fight between his tribe and the mohawks there anciently how the latter were overcome by stratagem the penobscots using concealed knives but they could not for a long time kill the mohawk chief who was a very large and strong man though he was attacked by several canoes at once when swimming alone in the river from time to time we met indians in their canoes going up river our man did not commonly approach them but exchanged a few words with them at a distance in his tongue these were the first indians we had met since leaving the umbazookskus at piscataquis falls just above the river of that name we walked over the wooden railroad on the eastern shore about one and a half miles long while the indian glided down the rapids the steamer from old town stops here and passengers take a new boat above piscataquis whose mouth we here passed means branch it is obstructed by falls at its mouth but can be navigated with bateaux or canoes above through a settled country even to the neighborhood of moosehead lake and we had thought at first of going that way we were not obliged to get out of the canoe after this on account of falls or rapids nor indeed was it quite necessary here we took less notice of the scenery to-day because we were in quite a settled country the river became broad and sluggish and we saw a blue heron winging its way slowly down the stream before us we passed the pasadumkeg river on our left and saw the blue olaman mountains at a distance in the southeast hereabouts our indian told us at length the story of their contention with the priests respecting schools he thought a great deal of education and had recommended it to his tribe his argument in its favor was that if you had been to college and learnt to calculate you could keep him property no other way he said that his boy was the best scholar in the school at old town to which he went with whites he himself is a protestant and goes to church regularly at old town according to his account a good many of his tribe are protestants and many of the catholics also are in favor of schools some years ago they had a schoolmaster a protestant whom they liked very well the priest came and said that they must send him away and finally he had such influence telling them that they would go to the bad place at last if they retained him that they sent him away the school party though numerous were about giving up bishop fenwick came from boston 
and used his influence against them but our indian told his side that they must not give up must hold on they were the strongest if they gave up then they would have no party but they answered that it was no use priest too strong we'd better give up at length he persuaded them to make a stand the priest was going for a sign to cut down the liberty pole so polis and his party had a secret meeting about it he got ready fifteen or twenty stout young men stripped them naked and painted them like old times and told them that when the priest and his party went to cut down the liberty pole they were to rush up take hold of it and prevent them and he assured them that there would be no war only a noise no war where priest is he kept his men concealed in a house near by and when the priest's party were about to cut down the liberty pole the fall of which would have been a death blow to the school party he gave a signal and his young men rushed out and seized the pole there was a great uproar and they were about coming to blows but the priest interfered saying no war no war and so the pole stands and the school goes on still we thought that it showed a good deal of tact in him to seize this occasion and take his stand on it proving how well he understood those with whom he had to deal the olamon river comes in from the east in greenbush a few miles below the passadumkeg when we asked the meaning of this name the indian said there was an island opposite its mouth which was called olamon that in old times when visitors were coming to old town they used to stop there to dress and fix up or paint themselves what is that which ladies used he asked rouge red vermilion here he said that is larmon a kind of clay or red paint which they used to get here we decided that we too would stop at this island and fix up our inner man at least by dining it was a large island with an abundance of hemp nettle but i did not notice any kind of red paint there the olamon river at its mouth at least is a dead stream there was another large island in that neighbourhood which the indian called sugul i e sugar island about a dozen miles before reaching old town he inquired how you like em your pilot but we postponed an answer till we had got quite back again the sunk haze another short dead stream comes in from the east two miles above old town there is said to be some of the best deer ground in maine on this stream asking the meaning of this name the indian said suppose you are going down penobscot just like we and you see a canoe come out of bank and go along before you but you know see em stream that is sunk haze he had previously complimented me on my paddling saying that i paddled just like anybody giving me an indian name which meant great paddler when off this stream he said to me who sat in the bows me teach you paddle so turning toward the shore he got out came forward and placed my hands as he wished he placed one of them quite outside the boat and the other parallel with the first grasping the paddle near the end not over the flat extremity and told me to slide it back and forth on the side of the canoe this i found was a great improvement which i had not thought of saving me the labour of lifting the paddle each time and i wondered that he had not suggested it before it is true before our baggage was reduced we had been obliged to sit with our legs drawn up and our knees above the side of the canoe which would have prevented our paddling thus or perhaps he was afraid of wearing out his canoe by constant friction on the side i told him that i had been accustomed to sit in the stern and lifting my paddle at each stroke give it a twist in order to steer the boat only getting a pry on the side each time and i still paddled partly as if in the stern he then wanted to see me paddle in the stern so changing paddles for he had the longer and better one and turning end for end he sitting flat on the bottom and i on the crossbar he began to paddle very hard trying to turn the canoe looking over his shoulder and laughing but finding it in vain he relaxed his efforts though we still sped along a mile or two very swiftly he said that he had no fault to find with my paddling in the stern but i complained that he did not paddle according to his own directions in the bows opposite the sunk haze is the main boom of the penobscot where the logs from far up the river are collected and assorted as we drew near to old town i asked polis if he was not glad to get home again but there was no relenting to his wildness and he said it makes no difference to me where i am such is the indian's pretense always we approached the indian island through the narrow strait called cook he said i spect we take in some water there river so high 
never see it so high at this season very rough water there but short swamp steamboat once don't you paddle till i tell you then you paddle right along it was a very short rapid when we were in the midst of it he shouted paddle and we shot through without taking in a drop soon after the indian houses came in sight but i could not at first tell my companion which of two or three large white ones was our guides he said it was the one with blinds we landed opposite his door at about four in the afternoon having come some forty miles this day from the piscataquis we had come remarkably and unaccountably quick probably as fast as the stage or the boat though the last dozen miles was dead water polis wanted to sell us his canoe said it would last seven or eight years or with care perhaps ten but we were not ready to buy it we stopped for an hour at his house where my companion shaved with his razor which he pronounced in very good condition mrs p wore a hat and had a silver brooch on her breast but she was not introduced to us the house was roomy and neat a large new map of old town and the indian island hung on the wall and a clock opposite to it wishing to know when the cars left old town polis's son brought one of the last bangor papers which i saw was directed to joseph polis from the office this was the last that i saw of joe polis we took the last train and reached bangor that night end of part three section thirty three Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. End of the Maine Woods by Henry David Thoreau.